Well, our next speaker, Ken Sawyer, um, is, if I'm not mistaken, the only um, portfolio manager that actively purchases portfolios of stocks secondarily um, in town. One of few. One of very few. Um, he's also a good friend, and I've learned a ton from him, and I think you guys will too. Well, since I'm the last person standing between you and alcohol, um, I will make sure that I, I don't spend too long. I actually have a fair number of slides that I think I'll go through. I've given this to uh, uh, this sort of presentation to a few folks and sort of modified it a bit. And so I'm going to go through it reasonably rapidly, and then I'll open it up for Q&A, and I'll try to keep the presentation to 20 minutes or so so you don't all fall asleep uh, post uh, or pre-drinks. Uh, uh, um, what I wanted to do is something that I'm really passionate about, which is really trying to, maybe by way of background, Saints started 16 years ago. I founded a fund really with the goal of providing entrepreneurs the opportunity to diversify their financial interests, much like every venture capitalist does. And the idea was that, in fact, um, prior to the sort of first dot-com bust, that there would be an opportunity to provide liquidity uh, in illiquid market points of time. Um, we've been doing this now for 16 years. It's all with all that we do. And so we're really focused on trying to figure out where markets can be more efficient and where we can provide benefits. So I thought I would go back and give some overview of public and private markets in the United States um, and then talk about specifically how it applies in the secondary market and what the implications, particularly today, are uh, for uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and angel investors. So... Um, since the stock market crash in 1929, legislators and regulators really went to work to try to figure out how to make public markets more transparent, more efficient, more liquid, and more trustworthy. And actually, what happened in the intervening decade really set the standards across all global trading markets. Um, and th they did a great job. There were four, uh, three key sort of securities acts that governed how liquidity works. And this relates to dynamics that, that cover things like, what information am I required to disclose? When can you sue me? When can you not? How do you have to settle? All these types of issues. It required these types of certain disclosures. It required public companies to publish something that we all know as now 10Ks or 10Qs. Um, it said, hey, if you're an insider in one of these companies, you can't trade right around the time that the quarter ends because you may know how the sales are going to be and no one else does. So they established rules around trading windows. They created insider trading laws. Okay? And we're going to come back to this in private companies because candidly what happens in every single private company transaction today among founders or existing investors is actually insider trading. And so we'll talk about what, how these rules govern private securities transactions and why that matters to people like you and me who don't really care about these complicated legislative actions. So in addition to regulatory reform, uh, market forces took hold and it created other efficiencies in the public markets. The amount of time to get a deal done. I, when I started off in the securities industry, I was an investment banker, God forbid I'm now reformed, at Morgan Stanley in the, in the early 1980s. And to settle a transaction on a public market, for those of you that are much younger than me, it took what's called T plus five. It means it said, from the time you execute your trade order, you don't have to settle for five days. Okay? Think about that. In the intervening period of time, the ability to time to process orders... Right? We live in the world of flash boys with immediate you know, trades going on. It really shrank. The average commission. When I started to trade, you had to call up your broker, God forbid, and you had to say, hey, you know, can I buy some stock? And it was totally opaque as to what the price was. It was totally opaque what he was going to charge me. I had no idea how much money they were going to do it. And it, uh, it turned out that the amount of money since we opened up the securities market and in the public market to internet trading and things like that, guess what happened to the commission? It went down really quickly. But however, what we deal with, what I live, I don't live in the public markets, I live like you in private markets and excited about private companies. And in that um, dynamic, these changes in regulation and transparency and all these other things didn't really sort of happen. And so in, in, as you relate to all the things we think about it, in terms of information disclosure, in public markets it's very high. 
from a practical perspective in private markets, the amount of information that people, when I buy Uber today, right, Uber doesn't disclose any information to me for the most part, okay? If you're gonna buy shares in Pinterest, you're probably not gonna get, or Airbnb, as many people do, very little information, or Palantir were an investor, very little information is, ex is exchanged. In terms of in insider trading laws, you know, if you wanna buy shares from Peter Thiel in Palantir, you can, he knows a lot, right? You know very little, okay? The exact opposite of what's allowed in the public markets is actually allowed in the private markets. Not legally, technically, but in practice. And the cost to transact, today, there are brokers that sell these types of private company shares, and they charge you a lot of money. Most of them charge you 5%, much less than the five cents a share that the public markets uh, brokers charge you. And the holding period is long. And when do you get an opportunity to invest in private companies? Not all that often, as opposed to every nanosecond if it's a public stock. So you would think from all this, gosh, if I look at that, where do you want to invest? Do you want to invest in the private markets or do you want to invest in the public markets? Looking at that, you'd say, gosh, why would I ever invest in the private markets, right? Yet what's happened? So this, this, the dark line on top is the actual number of public companies in the United States. Look what happened. Up until 1996, when it peaked, it grew dramatically, and actually it grew consistently with the gold line, which is the market cap to GDP. What happened 20 years ago, 20 years ago, almost to the day, the number of public companies started to shrink. And the percentage of market cap that as a, as a total percentage of GDP actually was flat to down. All this money stopped going into public markets. Look at the number of companies that used to exist back in 1996. And again, 1996 was before the dot-com boom when all these companies went public, right? The absolute number of companies in the United States is decreasing. Your opportunities to invest in the public markets is shrinking. A lot of people said, hey, that's all because of this crazy regulation people put in place called Sarbanes-Oxley. That's what did it. But that isn't the fact. When you actually look at the decline, when SOX was passed and enacted, we've seen a continual decline. And candidly, when we look at other markets, including international markets, Brazil, Mexico, Europe, everywhere in the world but for Asia, the, this same dynamic has occurred. Public markets are declining, private markets aren't. And of course, as been widely reported, there are many, many fewer IPOs. This is the number of tech IPOs going back a long period of time. Think about this. Look, look at how high it was back in 88 through 2001, but even before that in 95 and 96, how high it was compared to today, we're talking about 20x difference in terms of the companies going public. So despite good regulation, despite high liquidity, low cost to transact, public markets should in fact be growing, but they're not. As I said, they're flowing into the stuff we care about in this room for the most part, which are private markets. Look at what has happened to the amount of capital in the private markets since 2000. So keep in mind, we've seen over a 50% decrease in the public markets. In the same time, we've seen a 487 increase in private markets, despite all the great rules and regulations that we put in place to govern how public markets trade, the markets that are growing are private markets. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but you'd say, a lot of people say, well, what about liquidity in private markets? How liquid is it, given all this new money has come in? It's a complicated structure, right? We have people, limited partners, who invest in venture capital or private equity funds. They then buy a portfolio company and then Management and hackers and founders have shares in those portfolio companies. Parts, and they're actors who participate, right? In the limited partner world, family offices, sometimes individuals, but more often pensions and endowments invest there. In terms of who controls the private equity and venture capital fund, that's a pretty small group of people. Professional managers manage those portfolio companies. Those are the venture capitalists. 
and management and employees and my, minority investors are there. Some of those sectors have seen high liquidity. So today there's about a $25 billion annual market. If you're an investor in a fund, you can sell your limited partnership stake to another investor, $25 billion. When I started in my business, that market was less than a billion dollars a year. So we've seen a lot of liquidity there. And we've seen a lot of liquidity in the professional manager side. I'll just give you some data here. This is the growth in global what we call secondary fundraising. Those are one limited partner selling to another limited partner. Grown a lot, okay? And when I'm selling a portfolio company, if there are fewer public companies who can buy it, who do I have to sell it to? Another private fund, either another venture capitalist or another private equity fund. And in fact, almost 50% of all exits by a venture capitalist or by a private equity fund is to another financial institution. We, we've owned over 400 companies. We've sold a surprisingly large number to other private equity funds or other venture firms that are just bigger than we are. TA associates, those types of folks. And so, um, the area that hasn't grown is the area to provide liquidity to investors in those companies, those venture capital companies. Here you can see the global secondary directs. Those are transactions of the individual shares and in companies that managers and founders and hackers sell is very, very small versus the average deal volume of global secondary transactions. So within the direct secondary market, obviously the area we all care about to a large extent is the late stage technology and to some extent healthcare marketplaces. And here a ton of money over the, you know, through 2015 has flown into this marketplace. We've seen an unprecedented amount of capital come into the technology late stage VC financing market. And in 2014 and 2015, guess who did it? If you are a crossover fund or a mutual fund, and all of a sudden, you don't have very many public companies to invest in, and in fact, all the money's flowing in a different place because all these things are private, what are you gonna do with your money? Guess what? Chase Coleman at Tiger, <clears throat> right? Different folks at, at Fidelity, at Wellington. They said, hey, we're missing out on the game, guys. We can't make money in the public markets or, or there aren't that many companies out there. We gotta invest here. So look what they did. They dumped an amount of money, almost $40 billion, which is almost 10 times what they had previously been investing in the late stage technology marketplace. And so you can see this type of increase, not only by them, by hedge funds, by mutual funds, and by corporate venture capital, both in terms of dollar volume and number of transactions. And what happened then? Well, if all this money now no longer is investing in the Microsofts that are public of the world, they're going into private markets, what's happened? And this has been commonly reported. This is the actual decoupling of valuation between private values and public values. I, was just, I just came from visiting a company today. They're doing you know, monthly uh, you know, uh, annual recurring revenue of around $20 million. And I say, well, we're going to get a 10 times our valuation basis because we're growing fast. And what they have to recognize and what we talked about is over time, as their growth rate comes down, their multiple comes down because the public companies don't trade at 10 times you know, ARR. They trade at more like five times annual recurring revenue. And so what they have to figure out is... How do I figure out I may double in value and have in multiple? That means my overall valuation didn't change. So this dynamic of decoupling ultimately has to come back together at some point in time if you can't continue, if you have to start exiting to public companies or to the IPO market. So... What's happened over the past period of time, and I apologize I didn't have time to update all of this, but when we actually look at when these companies go public, most trade at valuations less than their last round of valuation. Most in this market. I'll give you some more data for people selling shares about the last 23 IPOs in the tech space and how that plays out. But you can see here, 
that a lot of these companies, and I will tell you, we've been, I think we're investors in three of these, so we know all about this, both good and bad. Um, we, the reality is, last round valuation, if it's being set by a crossover fund that's got to put money into the marketplace because they can't get in to be a public company when they're forced to go public, not sure how the valuation plays itself out. And making matters worse, the public tech valuations have also gone down a lot this year on an overall perspective from the big guys. These are the, we think of often as these guys as the buyers of, public, of private companies. So if the value of the buyers are going down, are they more or less likely to pay a high price? They may still pay a high price, we hope, but less likely to. And as a result, for the first time in many, many years, we're beginning to see down rounds um, or uh, challenged exits. Um, and you can see some of the ones here, also some of which we're investors in, um, have mark to market down or had down rounds. And as a result, we get into this cycle, this sort of downward cycle. Because what says is that says, all right, if valuations down here decrease, if there's a decrease in valuation and round sizes, the crossover guys who are marking up their valuations to get more people into their mutual funds now have to mark them down. They're going to say, I don't want to do more of these things. I'm not gonna, I don't want to lose 30% on my investment anymore. And that means we're going to have less capital to go around, which means the valuations are going to get pushed down further. And it starts to become sort of the opposite of a virtuous cycle. I don't know, what is the opposite? A de-virtuous cycle? Huh? Vicious cycle, a vicious cycle. So we think the cycle has started already. We looked at Q, not all the numbers are out, but we're just getting Q1 numbers. They're always slightly lagged because of the people who report stuff. But even in Q4, we began to see this sort of cycle begin to occur. Here's the amount of deals that we remember we saw it all going up and to the right. Now all of a sudden in Q4, and we, we are seeing the data in Q1, the numbers are starting to go down by these guys that went from five billion investing a year to 40 billion investing a year. Now all of a sudden it's starting to come down. So if you look at that historical on numbers, it's been double in the last couple of years to what it's been historically over a period of time. So there's a lot of $20 billion of annual investment dollars that are getting gonna leave this marketplace. And I know we were talking about CB Insights and some of their data. This is sort of when all the big unicorns need to finance, when they run out of money at their current pace and speed. Now think about this, I think there's something like 100 odd people on this list. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that needs to go into these guys. And we look at it concentrated between Q3 and Q4 this year. And so that's a period of time that we are just now sort of beginning to feel the pain. And no surprise, and guess what's happened? They said, we gotta go public. So for the first time, we've seen all these companies file to go public. Now, the companies are smart. They're run by smart, well-intentioned people. What are they doing? They're saying, hey, we're gonna take actions to address this imbalance of capital and supply, right? To avoid a new round, some of them are gonna reduce their burn rate, reducing the amount of capital that they need. Of course, that will also reduce their, their growth rate. Some of them are going to say, hey, we're going to, we're going to go public, right? So we took a look at how much value the unicorns have, when they need to go public. There's a lot of demand. At the current amount of IPO dollars available, it would take eight years if they all filed today to get them all out, given the available level of capital. So some of them will say, well, forget that. We'll just sell ourselves. So we took a look at the number of M&A transactions above a billion dollars. And by the way, we're just talking about the unicorns. We're not talking about all the other 5,000 technology companies that also need money and need an exit. How long would it just take the unicorns to lead if Google and Amazon and all the rest of them just said, we're going to buy all of you up? Take over five years if they all started today. And so what's happening? We sort of have the unicorps, the unicorns that have now uh, gone into uh, to, to the promised land. Uh, we've seen some bankruptcies. Uh, and obviously a bunch of layoffs and other things going on. So what does this mean for you guys? What does it mean for founders and hackers with private stock or options that you have? I'd say get liquidity soon, it ain't getting better. 
If you think things are getting better in the future and that, oh my gosh, I got to take a big discount off the last round, take it now. Number two, don't early exercise your stock, okay? I can't tell you how many people I talked to after the dot-com bust who had early exercised their stock, they paid a bunch of taxes, their stock was worthless, okay? They would paid taxes on money they never got just so they could offset some taxes. Now, I would give the caveat, if you're a wealthy individual and you have lots of money coming in and you can offset your losses which you're allowed to carry forward against earnings in the future, no problem. Most of us don't have that issue, and as a result, I would encourage you to be very wary about exercising early and paying taxes just so you think you can save 15% on your federal income tax bill. The last thing we say to folks, and yes, we're a secondary buyer, and yes, this may appear to be self-serving, but I can tell you I have a lot of very close friends and I tell them the same exact thing, irrespective of whether I'm buying their shares or not, okay? We took a look, don't assume the 409A valuation is cheap. I can't tell you how many executives tell me, but my 409A is so cheap. Like, I, I would never sell at that price. So we took a look of the last 23 tech IPOs. In the last 23 tech IPOs, 10 of them priced at a price lower than the 409A, lower. 12 today trade at a price lower than the 409A today. And if I take the average of those that made money, there was a 30% delta between what the company went at and what the 409A is. Okay? So do not be fooled that says when your CEO tells you or you tell your employees that, hey, this 409A is so cheap, the data does not support that thesis. It supports the thesis that actually, if half are below and half are above, it says 409A actually is probably closer to fair market value than the last round valuation. So with that, I'll conclude um, a little bit uh, just on an overview about Saints and open it up to any questions, which there may not be any, knowing that there is very attractive alcohol at, uh, at, the, at the finish of my questions. Um, what is said very good information. Thank you a lot. Um, the demographics of people who buy public stocks are totally different from those who can go up to the private you know, market because of people, even the upper middle class and middle class, a lot of money goes into the years, bought their own home, mortgage and so on, little money is left. They cannot seriously play in the private, private uh, market. They can only do public because they're putting a few hundred to maybe a thousand, two thousand at most, right? But yet, whereas the demographics who can invest in bigger amounts, so different. How are you, why are you comparing? Well, I don't think that's true. So most individual investors invest through mutual funds, right? And those mutual funds are the guys that are buying these late stage privates. So I think that the dynamic, I'm, I've, I've been in front of many congressmen on this topic, and I believe that, for example, we were early investors. I think we did the first secondary in Facebook before DST and all those guys. Um, I think it's terrible, actually. Look, for me, it made me a lot of money. Right? We still own some of our Facebook stock, actually, uh, which we bought at like a billion and a half dollar valuation. It's been great for me, okay? Great for me. Are we doing a public service to make it easy for companies to remain private and the elite in the country and around the world get to invest in that? Or are we doing a disservice? I'll argue Uber should be public, Pinterest should be public. Airbnb should be public. That would be better for individuals and the marketplace generally, and the transparency would be helpful, not hurtful, and that the way people trade and get benefits would be helpful. I am against, I was against the legislation that allowed companies to stay private longer, to expand the number of private investors that could be there, all these things I was against even though my business benefits massively 
from information asymmetry, the lack of the fact that most people can't invest in, and all the rest of it. So it's a public policy issue. As long as the public policy is wrong, I will be, I'm a capitalist, I will take advantage of the opportunity. When you actually buy stock, do you buy it from the employees? Do you buy it from the CEOs? Do you invest an additional round? Um, does it vary? We do all of the above. Sometimes we'll buy it from the angel investor. Sometimes we'll buy it from a fund. Uh, as is public, we bought an asset from Benchmark today. It was a, in a 17-year-old fund and a company none of you care about, but we'll do very well on called eBags, which is a $150 million e-commerce, profitable e-commerce company in, in Colorado. Uh, but we buy from everyone. Um, keep in mind, part of the challenge with having illiquid securities is that, in fact, they're illiquid. And so even if you're a professional investor like Benchmark, and this is one of the few that we can talk about when we buy from funds, uh, they did a press release, not us. Um, you know, we can provide liquidity. Now, that liquidity comes at a price, right? There's a discount, you know, because of that liquidity factor. That's how 409A valuations arrive. They're saying, hey, we're doing a discount because it's a liquid. But we do all sorts. We f do follow-on investments in the company to support them going forward. Once we go in, we act like everything else. When we buy from founders, we like to put a set of policies in place so they're not being treat they don't treat themselves differently than other employees. Um, and then we're also aligned with them in terms of being able to help them in terms of thinking about the valuations and the effect on common sh stock as opposed to just having the venture guys on the board telling you what makes sense. I was kind of curious about the, the drive towards the private market. How much does it have to do, do you think, with quantitative easing and specifically around pensions that now really their actuarial people are telling them, my God, you have to increase these yields. Um, What's, what's driving that as well? Can you go into that? It's a really nuanced question, and I don't know that I know, so I will say that it's purely speculation. Um, a couple things you hit on. First of all, I do not think it is all related to QE. Um, and I also think there is a very interesting thing about higher yields. What we've actually seen is most of the pensions have not been searching for higher yields, as you might expect. Um, they tend, they're not significantly more weighted into alternative assets than they were 10 years ago. The interesting point you make, however, is that in the private markets, particularly buyouts, they can use leverage. And there's a new, so part of the dynamic, if you're a pension plan today, if you look at, if you look at the buyout world, right, traditional industrial businesses, the only reason they outperform the stock market is because they have more leverage. If you adjust for that, the performance of, of funds looks almost identical to the public markets with the same leverage. The problem is, is if you're in a, a benefit plan, a regulated benefit plan, they're not allowed to use leverage to buy public securities. So the way that they get higher yield is they pay a huge amount of fees, two and 20 or two and 25 or something, to a buy to a KKR or you know not picking on them or Bain Capital or any one of them and you put your money there because you get higher returns just based on that leverage so it has driven money to the buyout market it has not driven money into the venture market uh, because of this risk dynamic and the way they do their ten year models so is the sh so the sharp ratio basically is completely different because of that the way that they're doing that basically. They don't really calculate a sharp ratio for those of you not initiated. It's a sort of measure of risk and, and alpha. They don't really, they're unable to calculate sharp ratios with venture investments. They throw the models off, right? In fact, most people, when they do it, they cap volatility at a certain rate so they can figure it out. So it's all, none of our models. I would say that's the other really interesting thing for those of you that are quant sort of finance geeks. <laughs> One of the things we haven't figured out is how to make traditional corporate finance modeling work with venture capital. And what I mean by that, Black Shoals doesn't work with venture capital investments. It does not work, okay? And we need Myron and the other guys here. But someone needs to do some work, someone way smarter than me, to figure out how we have sort of traditional, you know, capital asset pr pricing model type equivalent for the venture market, and I think we would see a much different set of behaviors by both institutions, public market investors, et cetera. Anything else, or are everyone ready for a drink? <laughs> Any other questions? On the um, discounting, so these are the issues that so how do you account for discounting and this, what do you want to Well, it's the same that a, a venture capitalist says, how am I paying this price? 
how do I decide what the C price round, the valuation at the C round is going to be? I think we do the same thing when we value this. We say, all right, am I buying the C shares or am I being sh B shares or common shares? How do I think about growth? How do I think about an outcome? What's the discount? What's the risk factor? How do I think about all those things? You do a little bit of, little bit of science, you do a little bit of art, and you come up with some random number. I'm sorry? Well, what we do, because we, we're resetting the time. So for, for us, we're going to align ourselves with whatever, however long that exit takes to occur, whether that's an IPO or whether that's an M&A event or whether that's a recap with a larger investor. And so what we say is when we go in, we're telling our investors, our limited partners, that, hey, we're in it for the long haul, guys. Um, and we're going we're gonna to ride with management and the team until they get an exit um, you know, consistent with, uh, with an IPO or M&A event, and we won't sell early um, is sort of what our thesis is going into it. Now, keep in mind, we're offering buying stakes. As I said, I was just with this company doing very well uh, this afternoon, and they've been around for seven years to get to $20 million a year of, you know, annual occurring revenue. Um, they'll be worth a lot. You know, their, their, their rounds will be in the hundreds of millions of dollars pre-money valuation, but boy, it took them seven years there. If I come in now... Right? If you think about how long they've been in, right, versus me, I'm going to be in there seven years less than they will have been in. So, you know, we're, we'll, 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 we'll right. hang in there. So, um, what would your public policy recommendations be to bring back the public market to the front? Uh, I would force disclosure if you're raising money above a certain valuation. And I would say, so today, there's something called a one, again, this is really wonky, so I'm probably going to bore most of you here, but there's something called, when you issue private debt, there's a requirement under, I do a one, what's called a 144A offering. Even if you're issuing to other private investors, you have to register your debt publicly. I would do the same thing. I would say, listen, if you're out there raising more than a couple hundred million dollars, and you're above a uh, valuation of above a certain amount, just like the guys who issue private debt have to file publicly with a certain bit of information, you too need to file publicly. What will that do? It's going to cause all these companies that previously said, well, my information has to keep private because it's going to ruin my business, right? Uber's business will be ruined once it shows its public information. It's so fragile as a business. Once you take that out, the argument, now everyone can see it. Now it's just a question of who's going to overpay or underpay for it, right? And if someone wants to overpay more as a private, so it's okay, but now it's all public, right? It's all public information. So my public policy recommendation that I've made to many people uh, on a number of occasions is to, in fact, just use the same rules and regulations that apply to private 144A debt issuances and set a threshold for p private companies to make that information transparent. Much to my personal economic detriment, I might add. Last question, Angel? Well, it's actually just a follow-on on that one. Aren't you just pushing the problem to whatever the threshold is then? Because essentially yes. you're acknowledging it, but you're saying smaller companies shouldn't have to go through an audit and those sorts of things. I am. I am improving it. It will never be perfect. And for some small companies, I'll argue, they're just not in a position to require them to do these big public, to do a bunch of public disclosures. And so I am saying that, you know, with a certain amount of capital and certain companies that are very early in their, in their development, I'm totally fine with that. It's not that I think everything should be public. It's just that I think we've gone too far in allowing too many companies, too many investors, too many employees of uh, large unicorns to not benefit from sort of transparency that I think is the underlying tenant of the financial success of the financial markets in the United States and around the world. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>